Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Uh, we are going to be trying to finish up the 13th chapter of the book of Romans this morning. So I would invite you to grab your Bible and turn there to the 13th chapter and we will begin in just a moment. Let me lead us in a word of prayer this morning as we begin. Lord, we come to you this morning just thanking you and praising you for your blessings, for your grace, uh, for the wonderful things that you do for us each and every day. We thank you for our country on this weekend of, of uh, Independence Day, and we just thank you that uh, you've given us freedom. Lord, we do want to lift up um, uh, those in our own congregation, those loved ones that we have that, uh, that now have contracted this virus. Lord, we just ask that you will watch over them, that you will, uh, will protect them, uh, that you will uh, help them to heal. Give the doctors wisdom in how they treat this and help this all to be taken care of quickly. Lord, I also want to pray for, uh, for the workers, for the nurses and the doctors who are working uh, with this disease especially, the, the stress that they're under. Lord, we know uh, one or two that, that are working with this, that... Um, uh, Lord, the pressure is, is very intense, and they're not seeing any relief. And, and Lord, I pray that you will just uh, comfort them. Lord, also I'm going to lift up Howard to you right now as he's recovering from surgery on his knee. And just ask that you will, will bless him today and bless his family. Lord, be with us as we study your word this morning. Help us to know uh, the truth that's here and help us to apply it to our lives. And we just give you the thanks and the glory and the praise for all that you do. These things I pray in your name. Amen. All right. As I said, we are looking at the 13th chapter of Romans this morning. And, uh, and the question we've been looking at throughout this entire section of the book of Romans is, how can I live a Christian life in a messed up world? And the first week of this um, we, we saw that the first thing that needs to happen, if I'm already a Christian, what do I need to do to live that Christian life is I need to offer my physical body, my physical life, all that I do as a sacrifice to God. <clears throat> he calls the shots in my life. Without that, there is no way that I can live a Christian life because I'm not really following Jesus unless that's the case. And when I do that, I see that God has a job for me. He has a ministry specifically for me, not that someone else, uh, not for someone else to do, but for me to do. Uh, and it's to work with the rest of the body, the rest of the church, um, to minister to others. God gives me tools. We call them spiritual gifts uh, that I can perform this ministry, this job that he has for me. If I choose not to minister, which I can do. I can choose to do what God asks. I can choose not to do the ministry God gives me. If I choose not to, the body, God's church, will still function, but it will function handicapped because I'm not doing my job. And so each of us have this responsibility that we need to do what God asks us to do and that we need to minister. While we're doing this, we have to recognize that there are some pitfalls and there are some things that I have to be aware of. Because you see, when, when I start focusing on my ministry and on the things that I'm doing, I, I take my eyes off of why I'm doing it. Um, it's real easy for me to get all caught up in, in how to perform my ministry and in what I'm doing for God and to forget the fact that it's really about loving others. Um, and so I have to watch out for that. It's not about me. It's not about my work. It's not about my ministry. It's all about the people that I'm ministering to. And then last week, we looked at how I, as a Christian, can live a Christian life in a messed up world and how I need to relate to a secular government. And we looked at three basic questions when we did that. The first question was, would we be better off without government? And the simple answer is no. God's the one who created government. He's the one who established it. And we need it because the way he created us is that we are social beings. And we need to have that social cooperation 
called government. Second question was, what does God have to do with government? And we saw two things that are very simple things. First thing is, God's the one who established it. Uh, he established government, and, and he did it for his purposes. Uh, and so, you know, that's part of how he's involved with government. And the second thing is that he uses government to help accomplish his work. It's not the only thing he does, for sure, to accomplish his work, but it's one of the tools, one of the things that he uses to accomplish his work. He does it in a couple of ways. He blesses us with the things that government provides for us, the things that government does, uh, and we talked about things like transportation and, and uh, communications and those things that government uh, very much gives us that are blessings God has given us through government. And he also uses government to punish sin. Uh, and, and so we have laws and we have uh, uh, judges and we have punishments for sin. Okay? And then the third question we ask is, as a Christian, what is my responsibility toward government? And the simple answer is, I submit. Now, that does not mean that I always do everything government says is right, because sometimes government, since it is uh, a secular thing and since it is made up of people, sometimes government's wrong. Um, and so I do what is right, is what the Bible tells me to do, not, what, not necessarily what government says. But most of the time, very rarely, uh, does government tell me I need to do something that is wrong? Many times it allows things that are wrong, but it doesn't tell me that's what I have to do. And so I need, as a Christian, to work in submission to government to change the government and to make it better. That's part of my responsibility. I do that through voicing my opinions, through saying what needs to be done, through voting. I do those kinds of things. I also saw that part of my responsibility toward government is to support government. And so I have to pay what I owe, taxes um, to government, uh, to society. But I also, that, that pay what I owe is, expands even further than government. Whatever bills that I have, uh, I am responsible to pay those things, as well as things like respect and honor. And we talked a little bit about last week about the things and the, the people of the past, of history, that we have honored and the things that we have honored that we now are seemingly dishonoring. Uh, and, uh, and today we're going to continue that discussion of uh, paying what I owe. So let me look at uh, the 13th chapter and let's start with verse 8 and read verses 8 through 10. Uh, he says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. There is a debt. God says, first of all, in, in uh, the verses before this, that I need to pay what I owe, that I need to pay my debts. But there is a debt in society that will never be marked paid in full. And that's the debt I have to love people. Again, this reminds me of what we've been talking about about my ministry and about those things that it's not about me. When God is calling the shots, my physical life is not about me. It's about other people, and it's about loving others. All my efforts, all my works, all that I do should be about loving other people. Now, I want you to notice, love can never be accomplished by commands or laws or government. You realize that? Love cannot be accomplished by those things. Government can't love. That's why things like welfare programs, you know, they can uh, temporarily help people with a physical need, but they can never solve poverty. 
They can never solve the problem of poverty because they can't love. Um, that's why things like ending racism, that's a great goal, but government will never be able to accomplish it. Now, Paul mentions one of the commandments here. Um, he, he mentions several of the commandments, but one of the, one of the ones that he mentions here is do not murder. Um, you know, do not murder has been against the law since God gave it to Moses not to murder. Uh, the law do not murder was in effect in Minneapolis, Minnesota when, uh, you know, and long before um, the situation occurred with George Floyd. Um, yet it didn't, in fact, it couldn't stop the murder. And that was murder. But notice, the commands can't love, the government can't love, but notice what love can do. Love can accomplish all that the commands and the laws and the government are attempting but are unable to do. I want you to think about it just a minute. What would have happened if the police officers in the George Floyd situation had treated him with love? Now, think about that just a minute, and I don't want you to think, well, some, sometimes what people think is love is not what really is love. So the question would be, would he have been arrested if they treated him with love? And I believe that the truth is, yes, I think he would have been arrested because love will hold people accountable for their actions. Now, I don't know for sure that he did commit a crime, but I believe that the, uh, the information that I have seen is that he had committed a very small crime and so I think he would have been arrested, even though they treated him with love. But would he have been injured? No. The Bible clearly here tells us that love does no harm. He would have been treated with respect. He would have been treated with kindness. He would have been taken off to jail, yes. He would have been put before a court, yes. He would have, um, have been held accountable for his actions, but... He would not have been harmed. You see, love fulfills the law. And so when the law says don't steal, uh, love would hold someone accountable for stealing. But the law will never, can never, love. Since we owe this debt of love, we must be aware of some things. So let me go on to verses 11 through 14 here. It says, And we do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissensions and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Since we owe a debt of love, we need to be aware that time is running out. <clears throat> I believe that one of the biggest hindrances to us living a Christian life in a messed up world is a lack of a sense of urgency. <clears throat> we believe Satan's lie that we have lots of time. 
that there is nothing critical. That um, that if we don't do what we're supposed to do, that's okay. We can fix it up tomorrow. There's no real sense of urgency. Our attitudes, um, in fact, we think our actions won't make much difference anyway. You know, it's a little bit like the, the way that uh, some people have reacted to the COVID-19 situation. They just don't take it that seriously. They don't think wearing a mask can really help much. I can't really change anything, and besides that, I'm entitled to do what I want to do. If, if I don't want to close my business, um, I don't have to do that. The government can't tell me to do that. The government shouldn't tell me to do that. The issue is, do I really care about others? Do I really love others? I really believe that one of our problems is that we don't see that we need to do this now. Our, our debt is to love others, to care about them. And love means that I do what is best for them. And if it's best for them for me to stay six feet away, if it's best for them for me to wear a mask, then that's what I need to do. That's what it means to love others. And I need to do it now. Notice, Paul says there's lots of things here that, that he talks about that they get into doing. Uh, because when I feel entitled, I go start doing the things that make me feel good. Even if they aren't good. Things like drunkenness and orgies and parties and sexual immorality and those kinds of things that we have seen happen. And what Paul says is, he says, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's an interesting picture, I think. Um, think about it. He says, rather clothe yourselves. Um, you ever think about why people choose to wear what they wear? Um, you know, as, as the older I get, the more I, I realize some things uh, about clothing uh, about fashions, those kinds of things. Um, uh, there, there's at least three reasons why people choose to wear what they wear. I choose to wear it because of comfort. I choose to wear it because of protection. Or I choose to wear it because of image and because of fashion. Those are the three basic things that I... that. I think, go into choosing what I wear each day. And, and um, uh, you know, back when mom used to pick my clothes, um, you know, she would choose what I wore in order to get a match right. Sometimes I need my wife's assistance to be able to pick things that, um, that will match and will go together, that will fit the fashion. But there are three things that we look at. Paul says to clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? Jesus is my protection. He's my, my rock and my shield and my fortress. He's my protection. That's what I need to put on each and every day. I, I may put on the mask, but the mask isn't what's going to protect me from COVID-19. Jesus is. But Jesus is going to do that through the tools that he gives me through the mask and through other things that I do. Jesus is my comfort, and, uh, and he's the one that I can rest in. Uh, that's why I'm not constantly afraid of the things that are going on. It's because I know that I can rest in him, that he is my comfort. And regardless of what happens, I know he's got me. And so Jesus is my comfort. And Jesus is the only image that I want the world to see when they look at me. If I can clothe myself with Jesus, I can, can fulfill this desire, this need, this debt that I owe to people to love them. And that's really the only way I'm going to be able to. Because you know what? Sometimes people get on my nerves. 
sometimes people say things and I'm just not sure how to react to it. And uh, sometimes my reactions aren't real good. But when Jesus is my image, he always knows how to react properly. And he can react in love. So, how do I live Christian life in a messed up world? Well, number one, I have to do it by giving my physical life to him sacrificially. I have to do it by serving others, by ministering to others through the gifts that God has given me and through the job that God has given me. I have to do it continually recognizing that it's not about me, it's about others. I have to do it by submitting to the governing authorities and to the government and cooperating with society and working with other people because it's not about me, it's about others. And I have to do it by paying what I owe. And the biggest debt that I owe is the debt to love others. Let me close with a word of prayer. Lord, I do come to you this morning and I thank you that you have given us the ability to love one another. Help us to have our eyes on you. Help us to clothe ourselves with you so that our actions and our attitudes and our responses to others will be just like what you would do. Help us to always be aware that time is short, that I need to get busy loving others right now, today. Teach me to be your servant in all that I do. These things I pray in your precious name. Amen.